Stanford University. The Human Experience. Inside the Humanities at Stanford University. humanexperience.stanford.edu. best way to introduce myself because as I have a professor I always have to I'm a professor I always have to start talking about myself um, so the best way of introducing myself is that I'm one of Anais's advisors maybe even her main advisor that will turn out the day that we sign off the dis dissertation on the sheet this is a strange day for me because um, I have the honor to, to to moderate a panel and to introduce the keynote speaker at this uh, Silicon Valley slash Stanford uh, colloquium. And at the same time, it is the day, the very day, that I start a blog on the portal of, of a German newspaper, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Now, I'm completely incompetent. I mean, I can only write texts, and then the editors of the German newspaper tell me that's not a good text for a blog, that's way too academic. And I cannot even post my own blog. I don't know how to do that, so I have to send it. I have to send it by email, and, and, and then they post it. I saw this morning they posted it. It looks really good. Uh, you can check it out at faz.net. FAZ uh, but this is a strange day, and I'm just, um, you know, I'm completely and only right brain. I have, I mean, no left brain. I have no rationality that would allow me to post my, my own blog. And this is what my introduction is going to be like, and this is how partial and biased my moderating uh, will be, and I don't apologize for that. Um, now, this is why I cannot say much about Marissa Meyer's real merits, but I can say that everything I read about her is amazing. For example, that she has a German family name, or <laughs> well, took a little took a little time for your laughter, but I thank you very much. Uh, also, that uh, she was Woman of the Year in Glamour magazine. I, I will never achieve that, really. Uh, that uh, she was named a young global leader by the World Economy Forum. I'm also too old for that. Uh, she was also listed on the list of the most powerful women three, three times, I mean, three years in a row, and she was the youngest ever uh, to be listed there. This is uh, absolutely glorious. So everything about her, everything you can read about her is absolutely amazing. Now, one may, of course, ask the question, why? What are the achievements? And then you get similar achievements. She is the youngest member, not she was, she is the youngest member of the Google Executive Operating Committee. That sounds like a mythological unit somehow. The Google Executive Operating Committee. She was, and that's history now, in 1999. I mean, I think 1999 was yesterday, but she was in 1999, imagine that, the 20th employee hired by Google and the first woman engineer. So she was always a first. And she is, that's also unbelievable, she is responsible for local, mobile, and contextual discovery products. So I think when I'm using a navigator, a Navi, as they say in Germany, somewhere to find a little village in Switzerland, I'm in, in, under her guidance. I'm in, in, in her hands doing that. I sometimes don't manage to punch in the right things into the navigator, but if I ever do, uh, she is my true guidance. Um, and you know, if you ask yourself why in everything I'm saying she is a first, she is the youngest, well, uh, she has to because she doesn't have much time. She's only 35 years old. And I think, I mean, normally one doesn't talk about the age of ladies, but 35 years old and three times on the list of the most powerful women in the world. I mean, we had a provost at this university, but she was not 35. Uh, <laughs> And she was so powerful, and she also has nothing to do with navigators. Thank goodness, one may say. Uh, so um, now, how did she achieve that? How did she really achieve that? Well, because she was not only one degree from Stanford. She has a Stanford BA in symbolic systems. That's one of the toughest BAs. Uh, only our football players and people like uh, Marissa Meyer can do such a BA. It's a very tough BA, symbolic systems. And she also has a Stanford MBA in computer science. And that's, uh, if you have these two, if you combine these two, there's a certain likelihood that you will end up on the list of the most powerful people in the world. But she also seems to have a soft spot for the humanities. 
So she supports the National Design Museum in New York City. She supports the uh, San Francisco Ballet. This gives great hope for the choreography of her keynote that she supports the San Francisco Ballet and the San Francisco MoMA. So uh, please help me welcome and look forward to Marisa Meyer. Thank you very much. That's a very kind and fun intro introduction. Uh, and I do have a, my, my name is spelled Mayer, but it's actually pronounced Meyer. And so I always appreciate people who understand the Germanic background and say Meyer. <laughs> so um, I'm very excited to be here today to talk about designing for the user. And more specifically, how humanities are put to use at Google in some ways that might be very obvious and some ways that might be surprising. And so I thought I would start with a little bit of my background, um, which is that I went here to Stanford, and I did a degree that you can only do here at Stanford, which is symbolic systems, which combines philosophy, psychology, linguistics, and computer science all into one major. When I came to Stanford, I was quite certain I was going to be a pediatric neurosurgeon. And after about one year of it, I realized I wasn't as interested in cutting up brains as I was in interest in, interested in how they actually work. And symbolic systems is the study of that. It's psychology from the cognitive side. How do people learn? philosophy, how do people reason, linguistics, how do they want to express themselves, and then computer science, can we give, create a computer and, and, a, and a, an algorithm that can do the same. And it was a really exciting uh, overall major for me, and there's actually a surprising number of symbolic systems, people all over uh, Silicon Valley, uh, all throughout different businesses. Apple, many of the people, the people who are behind iTunes and iPad are from are from symbolic systems. The creator of Chrome and, and Gmail at Google is also a symbolic systems major. So there's a lot of, of these disciplines that run through all of our products and a lot of the technologies that surround us today. Uh, but interestingly, because I had this in my background, did my undergraduate in symbolic systems, I did my master's in computer science. I joined Google as an engineer. And at the same time, we were very small as a, as a team. At the same time, we had all kinds of user interface problems. And we tried very hard to find someone who we could hire who would be a user interface specialist. And try as we might, as a small company back in 1999, we couldn't find anyone. So after about four months of looking, my boss then, the RVP of engineering, Ernest Hutzle, called me into his office and said, well, you know, we have failed to find a user interface person. And you have this, this stuff, this stuff that isn't computer science in your background, symbolic systems, philosophy, psychology, et cetera. Why don't you spend some of your time working on the UI and working on the design? So spend one day a week doing that, spend the other time doing your artificial intelligence work. Uh, and that's really how I got started in it. And I do think there's a big piece of user interface, how you design for it, and also usability, how do you test it, um, that is very, very intricately tied to the humanities. How do you observe people? It's much more about psychology and anthropology. How do people use things? How does it work? Uh, and I do think that there's, there's a huge opportunity to contribute there. I thought I would offer as a bit of background the first usability study that we did, because obviously being thrown into this uh, about four months uh, out into, into Google, I had never done a usability study before. Uh, and you know, usability is something that's taught a little bit in school, but not that much. In terms of the best usability analysts are almost always anthropologists or psychologists. Uh, and we came over here to Stanford to do our first usability test after reading many papers about how you should conduct a test, how to not bias the outcomes. We went to the Gates building. We sent an, an email out to uh, su.market and said $20 a free t-shirt and pizza. Come to the Gates building on Saturday at noon. And we got 16 students to come. And there were four of us who were there. And we were a little bit worried about biasing the results because we had done a lot of reading and a lot of background on that. So we set up the study such that we would have two people sitting at the computer using the same computer with one of us observing them. And we would do two sets of eight, right? So it was like sort of four setups, one before lunch, one after. And, um, and the idea was that they should talk to each other. So that, you know, you'd give them a task and they would talk to each other rather than talking to you because you might otherwise bias, uh, bias the results. And, even from the first study, which the, the findings were all very remedial, as you'll soon hear, um, it was really interesting to see just the type of impact. I mean, you start multiplying it times Google scale, how, how really important it can be. 
So the very first task we gave them, we got set up with our first students, we set people down at the computers, and the first task, we wanted them to just do free-form searching. So we said, we're going to give you a trivia question, we're going to ask you to turn uh, to your computer and go to a website to try and answer that question. And the question was, which country won the most gold medals in the 1994 Olympics? We'd like you to turn to your computer and bring up www.google, and we'd have to spell it G-O-O-G-L-E.com, and because no one had actually, none of, none of the students had seen it at that point, and, and do some, and, and construct some queries to, to solve that. And the students would turn to their computer, and they would, the, the site would load up, and 15 seconds would go by, and nothing would happen. And 30 seconds would go by, and you'd think, well, they're probably thinking of queries. Sometimes it's hard to think about what, what you should type in the box, right? And you're like, but why aren't, they, why aren't they talking to each other? And after about 45 seconds would go by, you'd be like, oh no, I'm going to have to taint the study right off the bat and like step in and ask a question. <laughs> and it happened with all 16 people all day long. You'd lean in and you'd say, I I'm sorry, but, but what are you waiting for? And they say, I'm waiting for the rest of it. <laughs> Because this was 1999, and web pages like Google's homepage that had nothing on them were just completely baffling. <laughs> right? well, like there was everything, you know, moved and revolved and was animated and asked you to punch the monkey. And so this idea that there was like this page that was just white and just a search box and nothing else was actually the biggest finding we had that day because we had this horrific understanding suddenly that we were like. Hundreds of thousands, soon to be millions of people, are trying Google for the first time, and they're spending the first minute looking at the screen, completely not understanding that that's it. That's all that's coming. <laughs> In fact, we went back on Monday, and we talked to our lawyers, and we said, okay, like we have this huge usability problem because they don't start searching. <laughs> and we said, can we put a copyright on the bottom of the homepage, which you can see here, right? That was one of the big findings coming out of this. <laughs> was, and they said, well, no, copyright is implicit. You don't actually need to put a copyright on, on the page. And we said, no, like we really do because we need punctuation that says, that's it, that's all. Like there's nothing more coming. Like start searching. Um, and so that was one of the big findings from that first day. But mm -hmm. also I, I, in, my, in my neophyte ways of, do, of doing a usability study, one of the more fun interactions that I had that particular day um, was that about midway through the study, one of our participants became very skeptical. Became just very skeptical of the legitimacy of this and just, you know, had, she had a lot of doubts. And she said, is this a real company? And, you know, and like, I said, well, you know, yes, it is a real company. She's like, how many people work there? And I didn't know, I, was, I realized I shouldn't maybe tell her the number because she might either take us more seriously or less seriously as a result. So I said, no, I'm gonna have to ask you to answer to ask that question again at the end and then I'll answer. And I was kind of hoping she would forget about it, right? That over the course of the study, she would come to believe that we were a legitimate company. But of course she didn't, so she said, so, okay, so now that we're done, like how many people work there? And I said, 80. And she looked at me and she just said, are you from the psychology department? <laughs> because she was quite certain that Google couldn't actually be a real company, that we actually, in fact, had to be, like I was a, psychology, I was a psychologist doing an experiment on some other type of emotion that I had just dressed up this search engine to try and, and to try and, and get at something else. Um, but I do think that usability is incredibly important and understanding how do users perceive our company, how do they perceive, perceive the service, how do they use it, what's easy, what's hard. You know, our goal is to have a product that people use 50 times a day, 100 times a day. When you start looking at things like Google Maps and Google Local, you know, it's something that touches people's lives every day. And as a result, it needs to be fast, it needs to be efficient, it needs to seamlessly enter their lives and really work the way that they want it to work. And I think that that's an, a, a critically important piece and some place where the humanities can offer a lot of insight. I think the other piece that's really important in design um, is around emotion. And one of the things we've done, this is what's on our homepage today, I think I have to do one more click to get it to run. There's a video here, ideally. If not, we'll maybe run it later. Um, but today on our homepage, we've added the doodles. And so the doodles are the special holiday logos that we, that we run. And you know, they're, very, they're very light and, and fun, but they actually do have a lot of academic research that goes into the background of each. So today, for example, um, and we'll, just, we'll see if we can get this running in a, in a bit, but we have a logo on our homepage which celebrates Martha Graham. 
And so what you would see here is actually you'd see this figure begin to dance and dance its way across the screen spelling out the Google logo. And we actually worked with Mar Martha Graham's foundation to come up with six different poses that are seen through her work throughout time, all of which have a specific reference and a specific dance. Um, we worked with an amazing animator, Ryan Woodward, who put this together. And you can actually see all of these different elements of Martha Graham's dance come together as part of this doodle. Uh, but we see all kinds of references here to things like choreography and dance. We sometimes honor scientists on the homepage. Sometimes we honor artists. This is one of my particular favorites, which was the Salvador Dali logo. But looking at that and trying to understand what elements of someone's work should we pull into the logo as we, as we honor them is really important. And of course, there's a lot of literary references as well. Some of them light and fun, like the Dr. Seuss logo on the top. Some of them, and Monday we ran the Little, uh, little Miss and Little Mr. Man series on the bottom, so you see Little Miss Sunshine there on the bottom. So some of them are very light, but we try to draw on things that appeal to our employees. Because, you know, because Google is something that gets used so much, one of the things that we see is that it's sort of like you know, your toothpaste or a chair that you sit on. You kind of forget that there, are, that there are people inside and that they have a personality and that they have interests. And pulling in the academic interests and the intellectual interests of our employees and saying, you know, today is the 50th anniversary of the discovery of DNA and we're excited about it and we're putting the double helix on the homepage. Or, you know, we have a lot of people at Google who love dance, and so we're going to put Martha Graham on the homepage and honor her. There's actually a huge amount of research that goes into the doodles uh, as we draw them, um, both from to, to make sure that we are academically, we have a lot of integrity as we do them, but also because now as a global company, we have to decide where to do, in fact, to run the logos. Uh, there's often a lot of international controversy, public policy, things that, that are involved in terms of where, where the, the logos and where this creativity uh, really pops up. And I think the, the, the basic factor on Google is today we have more, th more than a billion users will visit the site. So about one in six people on the planet will go to Google today. Uh, and when you're serving that many people, you need a diversity of people working there who can understand all of the different needs and really bring that human element to it. Because fundamentally, search, which is the core of our business, is about learning. It is about an academic and an intellectual pursuit. And understanding how do people think, how do they reason about this, is something that I think is really important. So how are some of the ways that humanities can, can really help us address some of the core challenges? One is that we've really excelled and succeeded as a company based on focusing on the user. Really saying, yes, we will make a lot of revenue, but we're going to first create products that really serve the end user well. So understanding them, understanding what are the needs, how can we create something like Google Translate to help people break through language barriers, how can we make our search that much more efficient or that much more comprehensive. And really focusing on the user is something that we've done. And getting insights into people, into the human element of all of that is an obvious way that, that the humanities can contribute. The next is around scalability. There's been just an amazing story of scale at Google, running both through the service itself, which scaling the service is in fact rather technical, and we've now watched the service scale you know, more than 10,000 10, times over in terms of content, and more than 100,000 times over in terms, of, uh, in terms of users and usage. So if you think of it in terms of an actual feat of engineering, we now have an engine that works today you know, about you know, 10 million times harder than the engine we had in 1999. So there is a huge feat of scale, but there's also the other side of it, which is actually scaling our company and scaling the operations and scaling our impact to match that. And so when we, when we look at scale, there's the fact that we've grown a thousand times over. You know, when, we, when I started, it was 20 people. Today it's 25,000 people uh, and 80 offices all around the world and understanding what are the challenges culturally as we go to different countries? What are the challenges in terms of policy, in terms of business? Really thinking about how can we scale our practices? How can we scale things like hiring? How can, you know, we're now in the mode of hiring several hundred people a week and understanding how to optimize that process, how to find the best people and find the best talent. There's just a lot that we can do here with, say, political science, public policy, psychology, really understanding how to tap into that element of scale and all the really interesting challenges it presents. And obviously, there's a challenge around global reach. And more and more, you know, one of the things that happens with a service as large as Google is that there is a huge amount of, of opportunity to have an impact. 
but we want to make sure that that impact is very positive, that is socially responsible, uh, that we, we do good for the world, and that's really something that we're very, very focused on. So as we expand, making sure that we really understand how we should operate in all these different countries is something that's very exciting. And more and more as we evolve our services, many of them have programming and partnership elements. So for example, we're very proud of the Khan Academy, uh, which is a way of an entirely new approach uh, to education that runs it through YouTube. So there's their 12 minute lectures online that are very engaging and interesting and they're really challenging the way that we educate. There's a school in Los Gatos, for example, that now assigns the lecturers as homework and they do their homework in the classroom where the teacher's available to help. But recognizing, finding these gems and really bringing them to the forefront and bringing them into partnership and programming that we do for YouTube or that we do for the main site is something that we're very excited about. And obviously we have a lot of very intellectual pursuits and being able to support, support the scholarly community is something that we're very focused on uh, with things like Google Book Search. So we partnered with academic libraries all over the world, scanning those books, bringing them online, making them searchable. So we can not only search just the words that are put together on a blog or on the web, but it's also the words that have been researched and fact-checked and produced and are incredibly high quality in making this, uh, making this available uh, to, to everyone is something that we're incredibly focused on and excited about, as is Google Scholar. And when I looked over different positions that were available, there's so many different ways that the humanities can can contribute. These are just some of the different jobs that we have open today. And so some of them we've talked about, like usability uh, analysis and, and user interface design, but everything from relating. So today in, at Moscone in San Francisco, we have our developer relations conference in terms of how do we create tools that developers can use to build on top of Google and understanding what are the needs of those developers, how can we build for them, how can we build a community, and actually understand how to relate to them better, things like human resources. And also there's the element of economics uh, and, and really bringing in how can, as we scale our auctions, how can we understand some of the, some of the effects of that. And there's a huge amount of sophisticated modeling and also understanding of bidding behavior in auctions. What will cause an, an, an advertiser, if we change the rules, what will actually cause them to, to, to work differently. There's a huge amount of psychology wrapped up in the economics behind Google. And as we look at hiring these positions, uh, one, of the, when we were, one of the challenges when we were small and scaling was that for a lot of these positions, we had to have our first hire, which meant that no one in the company actually did that job at the moment. So we had the, the, the unique challenge of interviewing someone for a role that we didn't have, which basically meant the people who didn't do that job were interviewing them. So you know, I remember being handed resume packets for, uh, for people in PR or for people in legal or for people in public policy. And I would say, well, you know, how am I supposed to evaluate them? Like, I don't, I don't really, I'm, you know, I'm an engineer, I'm a product manager, how am I supposed to evaluate um, people? And there's a really wonderful article written by a guy who's known as Joel on software, where he said, fundamentally, in all companies and across all of these types of roles, what you really want to do is hire people who are smart and get things done. <laughs> And fundamentally, as an employer, that's what everyone is looking for. And so when I think back on my journey um, to Google, two of the big factors that mapped to that and why I picked Google was I think it's really important to work with the smartest people you can find. Some of the times those people are at Google, sometimes they're in universities. But being surrounded by really smart people is just something that's incredibly enabling and incredibly empowering. And I think it's one of the big things that has shaped a lot of the important decisions I've made and I do think it's one of the, the key things to focus on when thinking about how can you, can you contribute with your humanities degree is, okay, where can I go where there's really smart people who will respect and involve all the, the background and knowledge you have? Uh, and the other piece is to do something that you're not ready to do. I think that when you push yourself outside of the bounds, so one, you have to focus that when you're doing something you're not, you're not ready to do, you're also getting things done. That's the other part of the Joel on Software theorem. But when you're doing something you're not ready to do, that's when you push yourself and that's when you learn. And, and I think that it was not obvious to me you know, why we needed another search engine in 1999. But that said, I felt that like, there were really smart people at Google and they had an amazing vision for how they wanted to change the world. And I was excited to go there for that reason. But I think that what we learned along the way, while Google has become a big success, I think we would have learned as much 
there if we hadn't succeeded just by the process of trying to build something like this. So with that, thank you very much. I think we'll adjourn to the panel. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.